Then we're going to talk about prayer. We can distinguish four types of prayer. Petition, intercession, prayer of thanksgiving and joy, and contemplative prayer. Petitionary prayer is when we ask for ourselves. God, please help me through this trying time. God, please help me find a job. Intercession or intercessory prayer is when we ask for someone else. Please help my son or daughter find a job. Uh, help them get through this trying time. Thanksgiving and joy is when we just try to remember God as we go about our daily life. It's kind of hanging out with God, taking a walk around the block, going to get a cup of coffee. And it's, it's a, well, if you never get to a prayer of thanksgiving and joy, then you're always in the position of asking God for something whenever you pray. And imagine if you had a friend that never came around except when they wanted something. It'd be better if they came around sometime and just wanted to hang out with you. That would be a real friend. And so uh, Thanksgiving enjoys when we do that. Contemplative prayer, well, that goes, uh, the intensity goes up. It's more like being with your spouse rather than a friend. I'll talk about more of that, more of that uh, soon. I do want to mention, though, that in this episode, I talked about positive theology and negative theology. And positive theology, I think, corresponds to the prayer of thanksgiving and joy. You're seeing God in the world. And people who uh, are of that mindset often want to do God's work in the world. They want to help the unfortunate in some way or another. Not necessarily, but that's common. Now, the negative way... It doesn't mean that the world is bad. It just means that you're trying to go deep within and put other thoughts aside so you can be alone with God. And in that type of prayer, interior silence is valued. And what interior silence means is that you can go into a room and sit in a chair and close your eyes, but if there's a movie going on in your head, if what you did yesterday, thoughts of what you're going to do tomorrow, thoughts of uh, what you watched on TV or on the internet, if those are all in your mind, your body is silent, but your mind is not. And a contemplative prayer aims at interior silence so we can be fully present and alone with God. I've had some contact with contemplative prayer. In the 80s, I heard uh, Father Thomas Keating speak about centering prayer. And it's described here as a form of a uh, method of meditation, but I'll have to say something about that word in a minute. A strong emphasis on interior silence. Contemplative prayer centered entirely on the presence of God. The idea is, is other thoughts have been put aside. Finding one's deepest center, profound depth of our being. Now, one point of confusion is that in the East, Meditation means what in the West is called contemplation. In the West, meditation has another meaning, which we'll see in a minute. Father Keating wrote this book, Intimacy with God, an introduction to centering prayer. Another point of contact was a, another book that I had read uh, once from the Middle Ages, late 14th century, called The Cloud of Unknowing, and that's a spiritual guide on contemplative prayer. Abandoning consideration of God's particular activities and attributes. In other words, not the activities like not thinking about uh, gospel episodes or whatever, and just trying to be alone. And unknowing, I understand, is interior silence. It's, uh, it's kind of a naked awareness. This book exists in a lot of editions. This one has an introduction by a woman named Evelyn Underhill. You can't see it very well here. She wrote a very famous book about mysticism, the turn of the last century. Evelyn Underhill is her name. Another book is, this book was written, oh, about the 1500s, I think. And at first it was very popular. But then, as you can see, it was condemned. Anyone found in possession of this book will be excommunicated. The author's name uh, in English is re uh, rendered Michael Molinos. Here it says Michael de Molinos. And on the next one it says Miguel de Molinos. I believe it was Spanish. And, oh, it was later than I thought, 1670, 1680. And its teachings came to be 
condemned under the label of quietism. And the quietism circled heresy was consists of wrongly elevating contemplation over meditation. Now here meditation is being used in the Western sense. In uh, Christianity, meditation referred to like thinking about a, an incident in the life of Jesus, thinking about the passion of Jesus, thinking about the incident between Mary and Martha. And contemplation was what in the East is called meditation. It could be confusing. At any rate, the quietists emphasized contemplation over meditation, intellectual stillness over vocal prayer. Yes, this stillness. Passivity over pious action. Well, unless you're the stereotype of living in a cave and meditating uh, 24 hours a day, uh, you're going to be doing action. But anyway, uh, the book was condemned. One reason I think that Centering prayer was reintroduced in the late 70s and the 80s was that in the 70s and 80s there were a lot of spiritual teachers from the East in the United States. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, George Harrison, but these are all various spiritual teachers. And what they were emphasizing was Eastern meditation, contemplative prayer, sitting quietly. We'll see, for instance, here's the founder of TM. We'll see uh, what he, uh, his method in a minute. But I think that Probably Thomas Keating and his associates felt that, well, wait a minute, Christianity has that type of prayer too. It was more popular in the Middle Ages and they were trying to reintroduce it. But anyway, uh, transcendental meditation, perhaps one of the most famous uh, Eastern uh, methods, consists of sitting for 20 minutes with your eyes closed. And what they do is they repeat a mantra, which is a phrase. And the idea is it's not perfect interior stillness, but it's concentrating on one phrase over and over to drive out the other thoughts. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a step towards stillness. If you can concentrate on that one phrase and say it over and over again, and the phrase is only, uh, I believe, three or four or five syllables, and say it over and over again, uh, that's a step towards interior stillness. Anyway, that's how that was done. And uh, I mentioned in another clip that I attend a Quaker meeting, and there are different types of Quaker meetings. This the type I attend is you sit in stillness, and uh, we sit for 50 minutes or an hour, and if no one feels led to speak, then you can have a meeting where no one says a word, but often someone will stand up and say something that they've been led to share with the group. Now, there's two types of prayer. The... Um, joy and thanksgiving where you're in the world and you're trying to remember God and the more contemplative type of prayer where you're withdrawn from the world in Christianity are uh, called sometimes the way of Mary and the way of Martha. It's an incident from the gospel where Jesus was in a home and Mary was just sitting at his feet looking at him and Martha was doing things, getting food or whatever. And Martha said to Jesus, shouldn't you ask Mary to help me? And Jesus said something to the effect that Mary has chosen the better part. And the idea here is that contemplation was often in many societies, even in the West, considered superior to action. Here's a, a book I mentioned earlier in this episode. Now this gets a little confusing. The book is called The Perennial Philosophy by Aldous Huxley. And it's a, it's, a, it's a thick book, but uh, Mr. Huxley happened to write an introduction to this book. And in that, in that introduction, he wrote a very short, concise summary of the perennial philosophy. So I'm going to quote from this introduction, but I'm talking about the perennial philosophy, not, the, the, not this particular book. So in the introduction, Mr. Huxley wrote that the purpose of human life has in many societies been considered unitive knowledge of God, which would happen in contemplation. You'd be sitting and you'd have a, a very deep, intimate experience of God. And that was considered the highest thing that a human could do. And action was the means to that. And he uh, mentioned some societies here where that was considered obvious, that contemplation was the, the end, the uh, ultimate aim. He says, though, in the invention of the steam engine, I would think it was the, actually the scientific revolution. But well, for whatever reason, the view became common that the present and the future were the goal, not contemplation. He goes on to say that 
anonymous writers of advertising copy have uh, convinced us that uh, the present life is the goal, progress is the goal. You see that in advertising. Uh, most advertising uh, it aim is to get us to want things. Often it gets us to want things we, we can't have. Um, I, I can't afford a yacht. I can't afford a, a real, real expensive car. And uh, if you think about young people, what are they told is worthwhile today? Uh, basically, I think power, wealth, fame uh, is considered uh, things to strive for. Certainly not. You don't hear too often that a young person should strive for union with God in deep contemplation and contemplative prayer. So I think we could say that the ethos of Western society, much of the rest of the world, is uh, focused on this world, focused on progress. And I don't mean there's anything wrong with that. But uh, I think that some contemplation, some uh, contemplative prayer for those who are inclined to it would probably do a person some good and uh, humanity some good. Now, I think that the Catholic Church may have had some valid reasons to, quote, to condemn quietism, but they also had some, I think, reasons of self-interest. Someone is doing contemplative prayer alone in their room. Well, then they don't need stained glass windows and golden chalices and uh, rituals like the Mass and incense. And uh, they're basically cutting out the middleman. They're basically going directly to God. And uh, it would have been in the self-interest of the Catholic Church to condemn that kind of thing. But they also might have had valid reasons because people do this, and, they, and sometimes maybe they get it in their head that it's a good idea to steal or to be sexually promiscuous, or at least that's what's uh, uh, has, that's been the typical accusation of uh, uh, of heretics. But it could also have some truth in it. Uh, there's a thing called discernment of spirits, and the idea is that it's good uh, that organized religion can be kind of like a guardrail. Like if you have a community of people, when you get what the Quakers would call leading, when you feel like you want to do something, it's good to have other people to share that with and get their opinion. Because maybe if uh, everyone or a lot of people have doubts about what you're doing, maybe it'll help you reconsider and maybe avoid an error. But I would say to sum up that if you feel that your only connection to God is through some third party, a pastor, organized religion, etc., well, if you believe God is, in, uh, is omnipresent, then that shouldn't be. Uh, you should be able to have some sort of direct connection to God, too. So if you feel your only connection is through some third party, then maybe you should re-examine your beliefs. Um, thank you.